The concept of the multi-part soul might be seen as overly complex compared to the model of the single unified soul, but one way to look at it is that there are multiple parts standing together in what might be called solidarity. The soul is an incredibly difficult thing to define, such that any description of it falls short of being sufficient to really get across the idea. However, with the spread of Christianity, we've lost access to any complete heathen understanding of the soul, and whatever complexities or subtleties that were held within this concept of the soul, at least as believed by those in the past, have been lost to time. There was likely a variety to this concept across different time periods and localities, just as we see variety in other aspects of religion and cultural beliefs. However, those of us that are modern heathens are going to be interested in understanding what our ancestors might have thought about the soul. In the modern context, there are various constructions, parts, labels to those parts, but first we need to talk about some of the concerns that are met when discussing the soul in the first place. And then we can dive a little bit into what we can drag kicking and screaming out of history. Most of the time, when we talk about the soul in our society, we're talking about a heavily Christianized idea of it, which usually leaves us with the image of a complete version of the self, lifting out of our bodies when we die, and then going to some afterlife almost immediately. And from what we can gather about the heathen understanding of the soul, we have a basic understanding that this wasn't it. The concept of the soul went under serious revisions in the social transition from pagan religions such as heathenry into Christopaganism and Christianity, as did several other concepts. One of the challenging concepts when discussing the soul is just trying to define what the heck it is in the first place. This is especially hard when recognizing that the concept of the soul is different across civilizations and religions in antiquity. But there does seem to be some association between the soul and death, that as the body dies, the soul does not, and that it goes on to somewhere else. So we should talk a little about the Christian conception, in which there is a distinction between the soul and the body. So, one of the things that gets brought out in order to make this point is the distinction between the mind and the body, or even further, the mind and the brain, that the mind is that which experiences, whereas the brain is the organ that's in your skull. Christians will usually hold that the mind is distinct from the brain, albeit associated. And atheists that fall under a naturalist or a materialist mindset will often say that the mind is the brain, or at least it's a subset of the brain. It's fairly agreeable that the mind and the brain aren't necessarily equivalent, as it's often pointed out that the mind is not aware of many of the things that the brain does. And many of us also have the experience of the brain not necessarily doing what our mind may want it to. For example, where are my keys? As you can see, it's unavoidable that this gets complicated. There's various arguments as to whether the mind is physical or not. I tend to agree with arguments that it isn't, but that's not something that we really have any ability to settle because several elements of the mind are just unobservable, despite the fact that we experience them, which is why, to me, it lends to being non-physical. But that's not to say that there aren't good arguments on the other side of this. This is a very old debate with great points on either side. So, is the soul the mind? Maybe, maybe not. Typically, Christian theology divides the human into three parts, and this is seen as a reference to, or a consistency with, the Trinity. And these parts are the mind, the body, and the soul. So the concept that the soul is simply the mind Going to the afterlife doesn't seem to fit with this iteration of Christian theology, but it's also what a lot of Christians will describe when they talk about their soul going to the afterlife, that their mind is surviving this journey somehow. And this leads us simply into further confusion about what exactly is being discussed when we say soul. But those problems are for Christians. And it does seem that there are many answers to these questions that can each be termed Christian. For heathens, however, there is a fundamentally different view that also has a multitude of constructions. 
The commonality with heathens is that the soul is built of multiple parts. This is an image of the soul that was common among numerous pagan traditions. We even see Aristotle arguing against it in his text, on the soul, showing that the multi-part soul had strong influence on philosophy, such that it needed to be addressed. So, let's talk about what a heathen conception might have looked like. Now, before I go into this, it should be noted that these terms are viewed in many ways, and what I'm saying definitely shouldn't be considered as any final word on the matter. This is a reconstruction of a set of ideas that has been mostly lost to time. And I'll say again, it's likely in antiquity that there were multiple ideas, even among heathens, about the soul. So even if this particular set of ideas around these terms existed somewhere in history, it's safe to say that other conceptions of the soul, or even other ideas around these same parts, might have coexisted along with it. There are two stories in Norse literature that discuss what seems to be straightforwardly the multi-part soul. And they have some small differences. The Poetic Edda describes the gods Odin, Holnir, and Lothar coming across two logs. And Snorri's Prose Edda describes Odin, Vili, and Ve doing the same thing. Holnir, Lothar, Vili, and Ve are all deities with very little known information, and it's even been supposed that this isn't actually a contradiction between the stories, just other names for what might be the same set of deities. But this isn't something that we can confirm. They might well just be two different tellings from distinct traditions that had different beliefs regarding this specific story. I love history but I hate history. Point is, three deities came across two logs, and history is convoluted to the point of making specifics impossible. Whatever the case, a couple of sticks articulated as ash and elm were given a set of gifts by the gods, which are reasonably consistent across both accounts. These logs are seen as leek, the first part of the soul, which is the physical body itself. This usage is a linguistic extrapolation, as the word lik means body, but depending on the context can refer to a corpse. So the lik without the gifts is lifeless, indistinct from a corpse. And yet, this would be seen as part of the soul, because the heathen view would have been something that is all-encompassing, but we'll get to that in a second. The gods then proceeded to give gifts to these lifeless pieces of driftwood, these wet sticks on the beach, thereby ensuring that they would have anxiety and overall making things worse. This has been widely regarded as a mistake because it ultimately resulted in the existence of Twitter. The first gift is owned, given by Odin, which gets translated as spirit, which isn't exactly informative. But another translation for the word owned is breath, the force of life itself as a gift from the Allfather. The second gift is Ulthar, given by Honir. An Ulthar is another word with a variety of perspective of translations, including, again, spirit, but it is also translated as sense or reason and can be seen as our intellectual self. This gift can be subdivided into the Hugr and the Mini, which can even be seen as parts associated with, but distinct from the author. Odin is seen as externalizing these aspects of himself in the form of his ravens, Hugen and Munin. Hugr is seen as the personality, as well as our capacity for thought. It is our conscience, courage, and is discussed using the heart as its seat of emotions. This aspect of the seat of emotions with the heart exists within our language today and functions in a similar way. Think about the phrases, put your heart into it, you broke my heart, I feel that in my heart. These would be phrases in the Norse understanding as part of the Hugers associations. And interestingly enough, even though they are modern phrases, they work quite well within the concept. In the Poetic Edda, there's a wonderful story of the warrior woman Hervor as she's visiting her father's grave to retrieve a legendary sword. She arrives on an island of graves and she approaches her father's burial site, and she watches the gates to Helheim open and fire pours out. Her father's voice warns her to go back to her ship as the island is engulfed in flame, and Hervor responds that her heart, her hugr, does not shudder at the flames, even as she sees the undead rise from their graves. Coupled with the Hugr is the Mini, 
translated fairly straightforwardly as memory. This concept is very much similar to our own conception of memory, except that it might extend beyond the individual, depending on how you look at the context. In the Heimskringla, there is the mini toast, the memory toast, that is a celebration of the ancestors. Now, it may or may not be a leap to suggest that the memory of our ancestors is part of our soul in this way. This would be an extrapolation, but it's certainly one way to view it. The third gift from Lothar is harder to articulate. The text describes blood and godly hue, suggesting heat and the complexion of a living body. The prose Edda expands on this, describing the third gift as shape, speech, hearing, and sight. And this suggests that the third gift might have been Hamr, another part of the soul. Hamr is the form of the body, often referred to as shape. This concept is heavily related to stories of shape-shifting. Odin was known to manipulate his Hamr and change his appearance into an animal or another person, often an old man. And shape-shifting stories would often include that the eyes would remain the same. And this shows up in the story of a werebear curse, in which the wife of the cursed man recognizes him by his eyes. Applying this, you can often tell if Odin is present in a story while in another form, because that form retains his famous attribute of a missing eye. The Hamr, apart from these legends of shapeshifting, would be the human form, the attributes with which we engage with our world, such as sight, hearing, taste, and so forth. Our form enables us to experience the world around us, understand it, interact with it, move around within it. And while that covers the gifts that make up what we would consider the self, the Norse also saw some other externalized agents as part of the self as well. For the Norse, the soul did not stop at your individual self, but expanded beyond into that which you interact with. And we see this exemplified during the conversion period with adjacent cultures. Sometimes, the pagan conception of the soul would get confused with the Christian conception of the soul, causing serious distress. The Slavs, for example, had a similar view of the soul that included even parts of the body that you might discard, such as fingernails or hair clippings. There's an account of a Russian carpenter that shaved his beard in accordance with the laws of Peter the Great, but he kept it with him in a pouch so that he might account for his soul at the Last Judgment. He didn't want to be caught unable to account for his soul and thereby lose his salvation. As such, one could extrapolate parts of the soul and the self that might have consequences in, say, magical practice. One's footprints as they walk might be considered part of their soul as they are part of what is left behind as they walk. But further, there were spiritual agents that in our conception might be seen as something other, but in the Norse conception were part of ourselves which is easier to comprehend when you consider that the soul seemed to extend beyond what we might see today as the limits of the self. First among these is the filia, which is a guardian spirit of sorts, always feminine and often animal in form. The filia would be an animal representation of the self as well as a spiritual guardian. One's personality might be reflected in their filia. Someone who is quiet and sneaky might have the filia of a mouse, whereas someone who is dependable and a hard worker might have the filia of a goat or an ox. In Njal's saga, there is a story of one such filia. There was a man named Thord Friedmanson who was a strong worker and who had the filia of a goat. One day, he mentioned to Njal that there was a goat lying in the field, dead, covered in blood. And Njal remarked to him that he saw no such goat, and that Thord should be on his guard, because it was clear that his filia had died and could no longer protect him. Thord agreed, but said that this meant that his fate was sealed. Now, there aren't clear distinctions between the filia, the disir, and the hamingya. And in fact, it's pretty easy to categorize these as subcategories of each other, or even as other words for similar things, as all three of them are feminine guardian spirits seen as part of the soul. But there are common trends of distinctions between them. While the Desir are seen as protective spirits, there are stories where they can be quite violent or even fight each other. 
One story in particular involves nine Disir clad in white fighting against nine other Disir clad in black representing the struggle between Christianity and heathenry. And these Disir are interpreted as the family filia, which further muddies the terms and how we understand these spirits. A third aspect of the soul that is beyond the individual is the Hamingya, interpreted broadly as a familial luck spirit. One story in particular, the saga of Via Gloom, involves the description of a Hamingya as massive, with shoulders brushing against the side of two mountains. The spirit would be inherited down the family line, guarding various members of a family and ensuring their luck. For more on this, I made a video on the Viking view of luck, which will be linked in the description. Now, what does this mean for something like death and the afterlife? And it's, it's difficult to say, really, but there are some clues here and there about how the Norse viewed this kind of thing. There are numerous ghost stories in the sagas that depict the physical body as left behind with a shadow of the deceased personality. The legend of Thorolf Twistfoot, which I'll link below, describes a man so determined to rise from the grave that there were three separate funerals for the man, and even that, arguably, wasn't enough. These are the Draugr, which seem to be the leek, maybe some decayed image of the Hammer, and some remnant of the Hugr and the Mini. And what's left is not the whole of the person, but shadows of them. And while these stories are legends, they do offer insight into how the afterlife might have been viewed, that something lived on in the grave. But perhaps that which lived on in the grave was not everything, but rather what was left. Ibn Fadlan, a Muslim traveler who encountered Viking traders, remarks during his famous description of a Viking funeral, as the ship was set aflame, one of the men commented that their lord had gone to the afterlife immediately. And since the body was burned, this implies something beyond simply the body in the grave. The Vikings and Germanic peoples generally would alternate across time between cremations and burials. Burials would include ships, wagons, chambers, whole bodies, partial bodies, burned bodies. There was a huge variety, suggesting a variety of beliefs around this. Grave goods also seem to imply a journey that something went on to somewhere else, likely the author. There is suggestion that this journey was aided with a wagon or a ship. There's even suggestion of special shoes in Gisli's saga called Hell Shoes that may have something to do with this journey. The saga, unfortunately, doesn't expand on this concept, so the details are lost to time. Now, here's where I'll get into some of my own ideas on the matter. One of Aristotle's objections to the multi-part soul was framed as a question, that if there are parts to the soul, what holds them together to make it the soul? One heathen answer to this would be the ond, the breath of life itself, and that when a person dies and breathes their last, the ond leaves and the rest of the parts now dissipate. That whole that once made up the self is never the same again. Because what makes you you is not a single one of these parts, but all of them together. Because, let's be fair, aspects of the mind are affected by the body. The body influences things like memory and personality. These parts of the soul may be intertwined more than clearly separated. But when the ond is pulled away, like a pin from a stack of boards, the rest might come apart, perhaps slowly. Perhaps the author remains with the leak until burial. There's some suggestion that this might have been believed, given how the body was treated during the funeral. Ibn Fadlan describes items being left with the body leading up to the funeral, as if to give some aspect of the deceased something to do. But as these aspects come apart... The filia moves on to your familial bonds. The disir and the hamingya watch over others in your family. The leek decays and with it the shadows of what it retains. The hamr blends with the dirt or the ashes. The ond, that breath of life, has dissipated. And the author moves on in some way, carrying with it the mini and the hugar. Perhaps the mini guides the author and the hugar to join our ancestors. All of these parts are different than the you that was you when all of these parts were assembled. So in these moments when you're alive, you are what you will never be again. And what you choose to do with those moments is what matters.
So let me know where you're at on this. Does this change how you view the soul? If anything else, I think it adds an interesting variety to the conversations around the soul. Too often it gets wrapped up in the Christian conception or nothing. <laughs> and I think that for something that's been expressed so many different ways throughout history, simply looking at two perspectives isn't enough. But with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. The like, subscribe button, and the bell are all parts of this channel's soul, so be sure to click them if you enjoyed the video. And remember to find a way or make one. This can be a confusing topic, and I feel you on that, but I hope I was able to hammer home the major points.